All right. Hi. So today I'm going to be presenting on the short story called The Egg by Sherwood Anger. Before I get into uh, the story, I'll just give some background really quick. Um, so Sherwood Anderson, he wrote The Egg and published it in the 1920s. And during this time, um, also known as the Roaring Twenties, and during this time, a lot of veterans and war heroes and soldiers, not just war heroes, were coming back from World War I. Um, and due to the booming of people coming back, there was a result in industrial growth. Um, and there was also high unemployment rates and inflation because a lot of the soldiers couldn't find work coming back from the war. Um, there were two main lit literary movements that we need to know in this time. And the first one is the Harlem Renaissance and the Lost Generation. So the Harlem Renaissance was an African-American cultural awakening based in New York, producing writers like Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes, both authors, which we, talk, which we talked about in class. Um, it introduced new dance styles, it popularized jazz um, and literature, uh, became more exposing of the African American culture and experiences. Um, so it was a very, it was like a very new topic for people in that, during that time. Uh, and the Lost Generation, it was a movement composed of a group of young people who came out of World War I with a very cynical view on it. This included authors like Ernst Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, oftentimes, the resentment lay within materialistic and materialistic things and individualism. We can see that uh, Sher Sher sorry, Sherwood Anderson, he also uh, kind of shared a lot of this cynicism and we can also see it in the egg short story as well. In the narrator, he also is very cynical and very as well. So we'll talk about that later. Um, so a little bit about Sh Sherwood Anderson. Anderson was born in 1876, and he died in 1941. He was an American poet, novelist, businessman, and a newspaper editor. So Sherwood, he was born in Camden, Ohio, and he was the third of seven children in his family. Um, unfortunately for him, he did not grow up with the best family conditions. He did not have a good father figure in his life, and um, at a young age, his mother actually died from alcohol, alcoholism. She was an alcoholic. Um, so he had dropped out of school at an early age and retired to write full time later on. Um, he grew quite bitter from not having a father figure and having to be very independent so young. Mm. Um, throughout his life, he, well, when he was older, he had four different wives, so he had a lot of wives. He had the first one, which was Cornelia Pratt Lane, and that was the only wife he had children with, his only three children. Um, and then it was Tennessee Mitchell, Elizabeth Prawl, and Eleanor Copenhaver. He ended up with Copenhaver for the rest of his life from 1933, but sadly it was not that long since he died in 1941. So throughout his life, he published numer numerous short stories, novels, poems, but his most famous work is known to be Winesburg, Ohio. Um, and it's a short story series, which, which style later influenced many writers like Ernest Hemingway and William Faulkner. And because of his very influential writing style and the meticulous way he wrote stories and really intensely built his, built his characters and developed his characters, he became to have the title as a writer's writer. So um, in his life, he did a lot of traveling, actually. He was born in Ohio, he moved to Chicago, went back to Ohio, went to Chicago, and then he eventually passed away in Panama. Um, but he, even though he traveled m mostly between Ohio and Chicago, he for a short period of his life, he did go to Virginia. And when he was in Virginia, he loved it. He really, really loved it. And so he really grew to love politics and got into writing about the development of Virginia and its small towns. As you can often see in a lot of his short stories, he sets them in Virginia. He spent a bit of his life there 
and basis he got a lot of his stories, like I said there. Um, and he likes to talk about the small towns and the agrarian roots. Themes. So a lot of the themes that Sherwood Anderson uh, focused on in his writing was grotesque. That is something, one of his main contributions to the 20s was his creation of grotesque characters. Um, the dictionary definition of grotesque is comically or repulsively ugly or distorted. Um, but uh, Cher would not only use that definition for his characters, but oftentimes he would use it in the way that his characters would take a truth, um, such as later that we'll see the American dream, and make it into something of a falsehood or something unobtainable. Grotesque characters, in, in short, induce both empathy and disgust. Disgust is from the, the falsehood that they're creating and empathy because they're the characters in the story and he builds such rich characters that you can't help but feel empathy for them. Um, another one of his themes is isolation and lon loneliness. A lot of times, uh, because it was also in the time right after World War I, a lot of people were isolated, the soldiers um, didn't have jobs, so there was a lot of PTSD to be dealt with. So isolation and loneliness and discovery of self and others' experiences. Um, Anderson often believed, or he did believe, that short story authors have become standardized within their writing of plots with characters that become just a part of the plot, creating unrealistic portrayals of life. Anderson instead wanted to focus on the form more than the plot, and we see that in the egg. He thought that each story had its own formula rather than each story following on standard. The stories had to follow an organic form that followed the characters in their individual stories. Okay, so the egg is basically it follows the, our narrator who is based in Bidwell, Ohio. And it's a part of one of his short story series called The Triumph of the Egg. So this is just one short story in that whole series. Um, so the narrator's family is in Bidwell, Ohio, and originally they are they are working for um, a farmer. So the dad is working on a farm, and the narrator grows up on the farm. And we can see the criticism within the narrator through the way he writes, and he even says it himself. He says, because he grew up on the farm and he was surrounded by life and death, he became a very bitter person or very cynical about the world. So the narrator follows and even spends basically half of the whole short story just characterizing everybody and giving background. And he even spends almost a whole, a whole page just talking about the father's bald head or his baldingness. So you really see rich characterization. Um, so eventually, um, the father is convinced by the mother to move into restaurant business. So they move towns. He quits his job. They move and they start a restaurant. And throughout all of this, um, the writer or Sherwood, he really emphasizes the word ambitious. So he keeps saying that the mother is ambitious. She's ambitious for them to do well. And slowly, the father also adopts the same ambition as the mother. So in the restaurant business, um, at first, they're not doing well. And then later, the father becomes ambitious to get do better and get better. He wants the American dream. And so he becomes ambitious for it. And so it, within that ambition, there's one guest, Joe King, that comes to the restaurant. And the father, he tries, he's really not, he's really bad at entertaining people, but he tries his best to entertain Joe King and to make him stay. And he just really focuses on that one customer, that one and only customer, and just trying to prove that he can be like a showman. Um, but ultimately he fails. And in the ending, it's a very ironic ending because he takes an egg, the, his whole entertainment was based off of an egg because that's all he's done for most of his life. So in the ending, he comes upstairs, he's heartbroken because he couldn't get Joe King to stay interested and he left. And so he came, comes upstairs to the wife and the narrator who we never learned the name of. And it looks like he's about to break the egg. But at the very last scene in the last paragraph, he gently places it on the table. And so it's kind of ironic because it, it 
di diverts our, atten or our attention or it makes us think something else is going to break it. So the egg, meaning, and themes. Um, so first off, one of the major themes um, is irony. And we can see that from the ending and the pursuit of happiness, in a sense. So the ending, which I just talked about, it was when uh, the narrator describes his father as about to break the egg in his frustration, but in the end, it gently lays it down on the table. And another part of irony is uh, the father. In the beginning of the story, he is described as a very happy man, or, and I quote, my father was, I am sure, intended by nature to be a cheerful, kindly man, end quote. So originally the father was very cheerful, but after marrying his wife and having a child, the narrator says that he lost that happiness. And there's the irony in that sense because usually having a child and getting married is one of the best things to happen to a person or described as one of the best things. Um, so there's irony in that. And also throughout his pursuit of the American dream, um, which is kind of a symbolization of entertaining his guests and becoming successful in the business, in the restaurant business, he is very unhappy and puts on kind of this mask of happiness. Um, the second theme is the grotesque character. So that's something that we kind of touched on. Um, for the father, the grotesqueness lies in his ambition and the American dream. So his whole restaurant business and gaining the same ambition as the mother is kind of a symbolization of the American dream where the people in the Roaring Twenties, they often would pursue to have this idealized life or this picture-perfect life with you know, family, house, two cars, or whatever it was that they found ideal during then. So Sherwood is kind of criticizing the idea and calling that truth of, you know, the truth of what everyone wants to be a perfect life and twisting it and saying that, you know, through chasing it, one can be very unhappy and feel empty. You have to give up a lot of happiness just to pursue this dream that is ultimately mostly unobtainable. Um, and the second grotesque characteristic lies in the egg. Um, in part of the story, when they're moving from the farm to the restaurant, uh, the narrator shows this whole scene of the father having his prized, most prized possession next to him on the seat of the carriage and inside is all these disfigured chickens that he had put in bottles and preserved and it would be like chickens with two heads four four legs things like that things that you would see in a ripple believe it or not and even though an egg it's kind of turned into something really gross but then through the father it's prized so it's kind of like a it's something you feel empathy for the father for this is all this is like his most prized, but also you're a bit disgusted because why would, you know, it's a, it's a little disturbing. And then the next theme is the story reflects the cynicism of the 20s, the lost generation. So kind of like I touched on earlier, it's the narrator. The narrator even describes himself as a very cynical person um, based off of how he grew up on the farm and seeing death and seeing the birth, seeing the whole life cycle of chickens. He's become very cynical about life. Um, and then cynicism is also the father's lost happiness, um, like I said earlier, and failure in pursuing the American dream. So it's a very cynical on life, the whole, the whole idea that we're never going to be able to actually obtain this dream or this perfect life that we all want. It's all for nothing. And I'm sorry, it's a little bit cut off, but at the end, the very last point I said, there's a major focus on characterization. Okay, so some criticisms of the egg. But Mark Sabin, Sabin, he wrote this one excerpt called Coming Full Circle, Sherwood Anderson's the Egg. And he, the first few pages, he really describes the narration and the narrator as awkward, confusing, and ambiguous. So it seems like he doesn't really enjoy how Anderson is portraying the narrator, saying that you know, he's contradicting himself with the way he is being cynical or the way he is ambiguous in his description um, and not really giving a lot of detail. 
But then he goes on to say, and I quote, the narrative structure is itself egg-like. Within the shell of history lies a second and more vulnerable, vulnerable sphere, the fictions one creates about oneself and one's genesis. The power of the egg resides not in impersonal memory, not in that outer shell, but in the revelation of the softer world of the imagination, end quote. So he was using that to say that it was a work of art, something that Anderson did. It helped create this story that one could really follow and feel for the characters and understand where they're coming from because the way that he's ambiguous in his descriptions is how the narrator feels. Um, the narrator is not going to over describe something or go into detail um, in description on something that he himself does not notice. So it really builds this strong characterization and you really feel for the narrator. So conclusion, um, the egg the Ameri is about the American dream. It's a symbolization about the American dream being unattainable. And a lot of times, Sherwood says, is saying that it can cost one's own happiness in pursuit of happiness. So it's a, a big irony in, in a sense and a big cynical story about the American dream in the 20s. Um, and on the picture, we can see Sherwood Anderson. He is not actually holding the egg, if you're <laughs> wondering. I just thought it would be a nice touch. So him and his egg. All right, so that's all I have. And thank you very much.